They're probably, I, I, I don't know if the show is still on. It's one of those reality shows that absolutely has to be fake. There is no way this is real mm. because they would be out of business because no company would ever hire them to, to repossess anything because they break the law all the time. It's just fascinating. All right, do I have now? How do I do volume? Name, volume. Let's see. T39, come on, come on, come on, come on. Look, I'm telling you, boy, I'm faster on jet ramp on moonshine. I get this thing hooked up, I'm out of here. Come on, Bobby, come on, Bobby, nobody's outside. Strap it! Are you Doug? Are you Doug? You have no, 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 Hey, let me let you know something. First of all, I'm a black belt. A 63 black belt. I don't want to... I got a brown one. My ass You're a black belt. I got a brown one. Do you know how many times people have told me that I know karate? You guys, you're not taking my car. Wow. 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 It's not violence. But, okay, so let's scroll through this. Was this okay? Where was it? Right there. Is that good? No, no. that's violence. Yeah. All right. You are entitled as a secured party to engage in self-help repossession. This is one of the great aspects of secured transactions. You do not have to have a court to approve repossession. You can just go do it. But you cannot do this. You cannot breach the peace. And that's the lesson that I wanted. There's no part of this that's okay. She gets in the car. There's a karate chop. They throw them in. All of that. Bad, bad, bad. Don't ever let your... Now, so... Is the loan company liable for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? These are their agents. They are totally liable for this. So, please, don't ever get me to Okay, we'll do some problems that sort of talk about this. But this is so obviously bad. This is the extreme. Yeah. So is that conversion? Yeah, it's not a legal... Yeah, You've, they have a right to the car, but they have a right to car only w through self-help repossession if they do it legally. So, what's the alternative? And I talked about this last class. What's the alternative? If you have a debtor 
who you know is going to threaten you, replevin. Absolutely right. Is that a court case? Yes. Is it a judicial process? Is it a is it reducing the case to judgment? No, that's exactly right. It is not. Replevin is a writ that allows you to go to court and get your property back. So if your roommate steals your stuff, you can get a, re uh, a writ of replevin to get it returned. Because it's your stuff. You don't have to prove it. I mean, you have to prove to the judge that the writ's appropriate. But you don't have to have a conversion case to do it. It's your stuff. You're entitled to it back. And that's the thing that's a little bit wacky about replevin here, right? Who technically owns the collateral? The debtor. OK. <laughs> is that a raspberry or is that a drill? <laughs> Hopefully that's it. Oh man. Okay. That's all for the piece. <laughs> By the way, I did not realize until I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was, I was leaving that I have dressed up as, you know, red and black. That was not the intent. I'm not going to some event that it's not a pep rally or anything. It just happens to put on red and black. I know I went there. Go cards. <laughs> okay, questions about any of this? This is 609, right? Yeah, you can go to get the sheriff. The sheriff has a gun. What's the difference between a writ of replevin and a judgment? Okay, great question. So what would, under 601, <coughs> are you going to put, put aside Article 9? Somebody owes you money. Are you allowed to go just collect stuff? No. no. That's why unsecured creditors don't have any rights with respect to collateral. Okay? You don't just get to go take the debtor's stuff. The security agreement changes that. But it doesn't eliminate it. You have the right to proceed as if you were unsecured. So think of it this way. You can bring a lawsuit under the law for a judgment for a contract violation. And one of the remedies that a judge can issue is the right to levy on the assets of the secured party. We're just going to have to deal with it. I don't know what it is. Okay, on, on the assets of the debtor, okay? That's a lien. You get a lien on their property. Unsecured note, go to court, prove the debt. Court issues a, uh, a, a remedy that allows you to get a lien on the property. Okay, that's what a judgment lien creditor is. You can proceed as if you want to be a judgment lien creditor under Article 9. That's what 9601 tells us. But you don't have to. The security agreement changes your status with respect to the collateral. You now have a right to that property. Okay? And the writ of replevin is a, a, a type of equitable remedy to get the property. Are they fixing the elevator? Oh, maybe. Yeah, something like that. So the difference between reducing it to judgment and getting a lien through the judicial process and Article 9 repossession is that you don't have to get approval of a court that the debt is owed and you have a right to the property, which is what a judicial lien creates, the court-sanctioned right to go and collect the property. That's what unsecured creditors have to do. They cannot just go to a person's house and take their stuff. Because they don't have an interest in the cloud. The security agreement is, in essence, a conditional right to the property. What's it conditioned on? 
They have a right to the collateral, but what has to happen first? Default. Default, yes. <coughs> 601 tells us you have, after default, the rights under Article 9. 609 says, after default, you can go collect the uh, property. So you don't have an automatic right. You have a right conditioned upon default. Where is default defined? In the contract. The security agreement sets out the terms of what default is. If there's a promissory note and no other language is included, there's at least always payment default. Okay? But default can be anything that the parties agree to. Alright, let me just go check one thing. If it's a guy working on the elevator, I'm gonna have to call. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. I want to see the It looked real for a second and I can't do it. classroom upstairs, so hopefully they're done. Uh, it's like they don't work for a university. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the exam. Sure, but can, let's put yeah. that off. Okay. okay. Yep. You went upstairs that fast? I am. You know. Pretty good. <laughs> okay. So, that's what... So today we're going to talk about repossession and sale. Okay? A little bit more about it. We'll do some more proper, um, problems. But, um, or I should say more like what happens after repossession. That's today. Um, we are meeting on Friday. I think we will get to the stuff on redemption and strict foreclosure on Friday. It's the last little bit in this chapter. It's not too much stuff. We'll cover it quickly. <coughs> Today's material is about the obligations that the secured party has after they get the collateral, so they either self-help repossess or they use the writ of replevin or they go to court and get a judgment and get it given back to them. But normally, we uh, so under, if you go by, just to finish this thought off, if you go by the system outside of Article 9, you have to follow the rules outside of Article 9, okay? So there is a method under the law for or closing on chattel. Usually it's related to something called a chattel mortgage. All right? So there's a procedure that you're going to have to follow. Every state has their own version of it. It's not uniform the way the article line is. I don't test on those procedures in this class. You don't have to know them. You just have to know they're available. That's it. You can reduce it to judgment and proceed as if this were a foreclosure, but you don't need to know those foreclosure rules. Now, as an attorney, why would you not use Article 9? You could just go get the stuff. It's ridiculous. Nobody, unless you are so paranoid that the debt is not clearly owed, or there's some procedural advantage in your state for using the non-Article 9 system, I can't imagine you would use it. There may be fact situations where the debt is so problematic that you're not sure it's owed that you want a judgment. But if you have a promissory note signed by the debtor and clear records about how much money has been paid, there's nothing to argue about. 
you've got the promissory note, and that's commercial paper, right? Those of you who've taken commercial paper class know that that document itself is self-executing. You can just foreclose, you can collect it just by having the piece of paper. So there's very few circumstances where you wouldn't go under Article 9. Now, Article 9 does have procedures built into it to protect debtors. Right? It's not a free-for-all. The breach of the peace rules are part of those protections, right? You don't get to go to the debtor's house and do a karate chop. No, right? You, can you trespass, right? So he drove onto the driveway. Was that, did I say that that was a problem? Probably not. It's probably, although technically a trespass, it's probably an excused trespass, right? You're allowed to go onto the property. It's called the curtilage. What we don't see the courts allowing is breaking and entering. Right? You're not likely going to be allowed to enter into the dwelling house, particularly or the garage, particularly if you have to break the door down or break the lock to get in. That's not going to be permitted. That's going to be a breach of the peace. All right. It's funny though, right? Yes. So I mean. I mean, there are cases where I would imagine a court would be okay with your garage doors open, nobody's around, it's dark. Yeah, I would say that that's probably okay. The more, the more peaceful the opportunity to get the, the vehicle back, the better. And an open garage doesn't feel as much like burglary as breaking, you know, jimmying the lock. So, but, I, you know, going into the house, forget it. I don't think any court would ever accept that. As being okay. Even if the contract said I waive my right. You can't waive this right. 602. You cannot waive the agreement that a uh, repossession can, uh, cannot breach the peace. That cannot be waived by the debtor. Why would that be? Well, think about what's going on here. We're, we got a fight going on. The police have to, may have to be called. Namers may get involved. The people next door may really like the person who owns the car and come across and continue the fight. Maybe it gets even more violent. There's an aspect of the effect on the community that the breach of the peace involves. And the debtor should not be allowed to waive that concern for the community, for the safety of the community. All right, so um, we got to problem... 30, uh, what, what was the last one we did? Did we get to 133? Yeah, here we go. So, uh, no, maybe 131? Is that yes. the, would that be the next one? We skipped over 127. So we have to talk about the repossession of the car here. That sound right? Sounds good. 131. So, question A. What happens? What does the secured party do in repossessing the collateral? property for purposes of repossession is automatically be able, going to be a breach of the peace. No, because we were just talking about the use of the driveway, it's probably okay. Yeah. It's probably an excused entry onto the property. If you're not breaking into a dwelling, you're only entering onto the curtilage area of the land. Okay. Um, what else? They did, they broke the window. You think that'll be a problem? What time of day was it? Two a.m. Is the fact that it's nighttime a, a good factor or a bad factor? Oh, I, I don't know. Like to me, it kind of seems bad. 
Why? I'm going to tell you an expression that one of the, I think it's White Summers in their treatise on this say, nighttime is the right time. <laughs> okay, and the reason is why? It reduces the amount of risk of a breach of the peace, doesn't it? I mean, if it's late at night, are there more or fewer people around? Probably fewer. So you're probably okay. In fact, you'll probably see a lot of repos occurring at night. Difficult ones. Ones where they have trouble uh, pulling up. So I don't think there's anything wrong with going at night. Although I can see why you're, you're worried about it, right? You're like, oh my gosh, it feels like they're, they look like burglars when they show up, right? Mm -hmm. Breaking the car window? What do we think? Well, they got to break into the car somehow, don't they? They got to do something to it. What's that called? A Slim Jim, right? But if, yeah, if they're professional repo people, they probably have one of those. Not a rock. Not a rock. Okay. He, he complains about the repossession. When does he complain? That certainly would be a breach right. of the peace. Breaking the window, I, could you see a court saying that that feels like it's too much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna say, well, I, I can't tell you one way or the other, right? I could see a court saying, you know, you know breaking the window, my gosh, it's loud. But there's nobody around, and it's the only way you can get into the car. Does it matter if you damage the car? Uh, yes, there are possibilities for it, does the uh, secure party have an obligation to take care of the collateral once they have it? What's the section that tells us that? 207, right? 207 says that they have to use reasonable care. So the question will be, was it reasonable to break the window? Uh, I like the idea of, you know, they got the Slim Jims. They could, uh, you know, repo, uh, what do you call it? repo person? I want, right? I don't know what the, what, what's the technical name for that? Repo man is more of a casual name. Collection agents, I guess is what we would call them. Um, right, I don't want to denigrate. I mean, it's a, it's a job, just like any other job. Um, they should, they have, usually have tools, like when you, when you repossess a car on the street, there's a way to disconnect the uh, transmission, right? And then the car rolls away easily. That's how they do it. Uh, they go underneath, they disconnect the transmission, and the car can be pulled away. Because, you know, you've got the parking brake on, right? So if you've got the brake on, how does the car go away? Well, they can mess with the car. But that's okay, right? <coughs> that's not breaking it. Breaking it feels kind of bad. If he protests at the time of the repossession, we probably have a breach. If he protests afterwards, I would have punched you in the face. Is that going to be a breach of the peace? If you come back here ever again, I'll punch you in the face. Breach of the peace? The comment, oh, sorry, go ahead. The car's already gone? Car's already gone. Too late. The comments talk about imminent threat to a breach of the peace, right? It's not hypothetical. It is that it's more likely that it's going to happen. It has to be imminent. It has to be something that's going to occur now. If it, the car's already gone, it's too late. Right, so it's at the moment when the car is being repossessed. Okay. Uh, B. The brother-in-law, who is a sheriff, comes along. Problem with that? Yes. Why? <laughs> Self-help repossession cannot involve the, uh, the police. The sheriff, doesn't matter. Anybody pointing a gun? Is that okay? No. Any use of force against the debtor is going to be a breach of the peace. So B, I'm going to say, no go ever. Cannot bring along law enforcement. 
see. When no one was at home, they broke into the garage to the use of the services of a locksmith. What do we think? Breach of the peace? Yeah. The entering onto the property is probably excused, but burglary itself <coughs> is not. So breaking and entering, things like that is, uh, are not going to be excused. Don Jose phoned Morales and said the car was being recalled because of an unsafe engine mount. He brought the car that morning, and when the time came to pick up the car, he said, ha ha, that was a joke. I'm keeping your car. Is that a breach of the peace? Well, there's a quoted case in Alabama that says that's not fair, you can't do that. But there are many cases that say, eh, right? Trickery is cool because it gets people to do stuff without any threat of violence. So I think in a lot of jurisdictions that would be okay. It'd be okay to lie. All right. Questions about problem 131. The best part of the case the Hillman versus Cobato case is the, here, I want to make sure I read this correctly. <coughs> to hell with this, we're taking the cows. I love that language. None of this is okay. Okay, the right, first of all, he brought along law enforcement. Second, he disregards what law enforcement tells him. He gets told by the people that are there, like, hey, don't take it. And he runs into the barn and he starts beating on the cows and he, oh, every part of this is bad. So that's why the case is in here. But um, the stern warning by the owner, I do not want you to take my stuff. But let's flip that over. What if they said, I'd really rather you didn't, but I'm not going to stop you. Breach of the peace? No. No, oh, that happens a lot. There are a lot of cases where courts have said, you know, it's OK. There are cases where they go to the house and they talk to the child. And the child says, yeah, come on in. Now, if it's a, if it's a young child, they're probably not going to be OK with it. But an older kid, somebody else living in the building, like a roommate, roommate says, yeah, come on in. I'm taking the debtor stuff. Are you OK with that? I don't care. Walks out with it. Probably all right. OK? So that's the flip of that. If if they don't protest, they actually give the creditor, the secured party, I should say, the right to foreclose. And that's going to be OK. All right, problem 132. All right, we're on now on 358. Uh, Octopus National Bank financed Melody's purchase of a new car. The loan agreement provided that on default, the bank had all the rights in part six. And the parties agreed that the bank would not be liable for conversion. And this is a payment. They take the car in the dead of the night from its parking place in front of her home. She protested the next day, claiming that her golf clubs were in the trunk. The only thing that this question really is asking is, have they done anything wrong by stealing other stuff? Yeah. Um, yes, the debtor has the right to the golf club. Sure. The They're not collateral. Mm -hmm. Have they? done something illegal that ruins the repossession? No. Okay, so there, she's entitled to her golf clubs back. Maybe there might be some liability for conversion if she can establish that the clubs were in the car. So if you're a secured party and you know that these rules are out there, what would you tell all of the repossession companies that are working with you? Do an inventory, see what's in the car, and make sure that we, so we can get it back to the debtor, because we only have the cars. I keep saying car, there's very little else that's commonly you, uh, repossessed through self-help because it's usually inside. It's, you know, even if it's movable, it's probably located in a building. So, but you know, construction equipment, I could see that being just out on a work site, enter onto the work site, drive off with it. Yeah? Would another example be like a boat in a marina? Sure. I don't think that that would be a problem at all, right? Just walk down to the dock, hop in. If you have a key or you hotwire it, sure. Why would that be a problem? It'd be great. No question. Um, say you're at a construction site and they have like a like some kind of fence or chain up there, but it's not really like that secure. Like, where does it cross the line between breaking and just like taking it? Yeah, you know, 
gets to the, it, it, this is not clear. Um, you know, cutting through a fence, not ideal. Particularly if it's property, like, so the construction stuff is problematic because it's often on somebody else's property, right? The construction equipment is located on a third party who's not related to the debt. Is it okay? Do you have permission to trespass on someone else's property? Doesn't feel as right. What if it's parked in Walmart's parking lot? Can you repossess it there? Well, it's, Walmart, it's Walmart's parking lot, but it, it feels kind of public. Yeah. There's no clear line that I can say yes or no. What you have to do if you're answering this question, you just say, you can't do it with a breach of the peace if it's on a public street and there's no, um, nobody challenging you, it's clearly okay. If there's a threat of violence either, and, and the debtor can be the one who threatens the violence. That's the, the cool thing here, right? So if you're the debtor, what should you do? Carry a gun. You point a gun at, a, at, at, the, uh, at, at the person coming to take the car back? That's breach of the peace. You caused it, it's still a breach of the peace. Right? The guy says, I'm a karate expert. Breach of the peace. At that point, the towing company has to leave. Now, can they come back later? Yes. I would think so. Well, if they've already breached the peace, you mean? Yeah, or but they, but they stop. The, 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 there's a risk of a breach of the peace, and they leave. They don't repossess. Can they come back later and do the repossession later when there wouldn't be a breach of the peace? I would think so, but the collateral probably won't. Well, it may not be, but if it is, they're fine. Remember, your rights under Article 9 are cumulative. You can exercise them as much as you want. You're, there's no race, uh, uh, race judicata here. You get to come back as often as you need to to get as much collateral as you're entitled to to pay off the loan. You're not prohibited from coming back. There's no law in, our, in uh, Part 6 that prohibits you from coming back. Um, 133. There's kids in the back. What's that called? Yes. Um, in the case that's cited, I, as I recall, the, the, the repo man came back with the car, dropped the car off, and gave the kids back. That was deemed okay because they came right back. They're like, oops. So, like, but it's a bad idea. Yeah. How is that going to go down? Because that's <laughs> Like, that yes. Be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he gave the car back. Okay. So that ended it. It wasn't a repossession. So there's no, since the repossession was terminated, <coughs> the debtor still has the collateral. Yeah. So it's not open. It, at least the Article 9 part of it is okay. Now, is there also law that makes it illegal to take people's kids? Oh, yeah. Right? This is a terrible idea. And it happens all the time. Right? They're, they see the car in front of the 7-Eleven, and they hop in, and they drive off, and there are four kids sitting in the back. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Mm. You bring the car back. You obviously give the kids back. But you bring the car back, and you walk away. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> All right, 134. Jessica, she, she shows up uh, with the car and intends to uh, surrender it. Can Owen be saying, no thanks, I'm suing you? Where does it say that? Where does it say they have to do what the debtor says they want? The debtor says, I want you to foreclose on my car. Where does it say that the secure party has to foreclose on the car? I forgot my copy of the code. That is absolutely negligent on my part. Is there anywhere in the code that says you got to do what the debtor tells you when it comes to how they proceed for seeking repayment of the loan? Right. They can say no thanks. Yeah. 
Why would they, do you think? Why would they do that? Do you think? Why would in this circumstance? What would be a fact pattern? Maybe the car is in terrible shape. Maybe they realize they could never sell it. Maybe they think there are other assets that they can go out and get. Right? Forget the car. The car's not worth anything. We're just going to sue you and go after other collateral. They can do anything they want in terms of choosing how they get repaid. Either waiting for the payment foreclosing on the assets that are collateral or suing and getting a judgment. They can do any of those. They're not bound by uh, any restriction. Sorry. I just looked back and I was like, oh, they're hugging. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. All right. Um, the one thing I want to emphasize at this point is 362K of the bankruptcy code. So if you're the debtor and you know that this is possible, how do you stop it? You file bankruptcy. If you file bankruptcy, none of this is legal. It's all illegal. There's no breach of the peace. It's just stop. What does a creditor have to do to be allowed to foreclose once the debtor has filed bankruptcy. <coughs> they have to move for a relief from stay. They can, it's not guaranteed though. And if there's some argument that the collateral is required for the reorganization, so if it's a chapter 11 bankruptcy, the court's gonna say no. But if the debtor has no equity, or it's a chapter seven liquidation, probably they're gonna get relief from stay. But instead of being able to go that day and get the car, they're gonna to have to wait several months or maybe even years until they're allowed to do it. The worst part about it is 362K, you're liable for damages. And what the bankruptcy court can do is, um, and uh, 362K says, an individual injured by any willful violation of a stay provided by this section shall recover actual damages, including costs, attorney's fees, and appropriate, in appropriate circumstances may recover punitive damages. So that's the stick that the bankruptcy court has against secured parties for overstepping the automatic stay. They can uh, be liable for punitive damages. So they're very good about not. Um, again, uh, there's a little reference here to strict foreclosure. We'll do that next class. Uh, I'll just explain what it is. It's the keeping the collateral instead of selling it, okay? All right, so let's look at uh, 136. <coughs> and this is on page 360. After Nightflyer Loan Company has repossessed Lynn Brown's car, it decided to advertise it for bids in a local newspaper. Is this a private or a public sale? Okay, so we've got the car. It's legally repossessed. Let's start talking about what we have to do after that. Right? So we've talked about how you get it. Now you got it, what do you have to do? One option is sell it, right? 610, you can sell, lease, license, or otherwise dispose of the collateral. You don't have to do any of that, but you can do any, uh, you're not required to do any specific thing, but you can do any of those things, okay? Including, isn't there a language in 16 that says use the collateral? Yeah, I forgot my copy of the code, which is completely negligent, and I freely admit to that. Okay. Six ten. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you don't you don't confuse the two codes. All right. So, what kind of sale is this? They're advertising it. Public or private sale? Put your hand up if you think this makes it a public sale. Put your hand up if you think this makes it a private sale. None of you? What does the facts to the facts say? What does the advertising uh, advertisement say? According to the problem. What are they advertising for? Okay. That can result in a public sale or a private sale? 
It's going to be a private sale. What's a public sale? An auction, yes. A public sale is an auction. Does everybody know what an auction is? You've probably never been to one, but they are exactly like you've seen them on TV. A person stands at the front of the room, or if it's a real estate sale on the lawn, starts offering out prices to people, people raise their hand and bid, and then the highest bidder wins. That's public because you've been, you advertise it publicly and you've invited anybody to show up. If you are negotiating a private contract between you and one other party, that's a private sale. Okay? So the advertisement that, hey, do you want to come talk to me about buying this stuff is not an auction. That is a private sale. Okay? Now, what's better for the price? An auction or a private sale? What do you think? Uh, auction, you have more people. Oh. Auction, you have more people, but what? who said private sale? Why private sale? Well, I'll tell you, when you go to an auction, you're just bidding against whoever else is there. So the price usually goes below market value. They actually do. That's right. And in most cases, particularly with personal property, auction sales tend to get lower prices unless they're well done right so if you any if you've ever seen i think it's in the mecham it's a car sale auction those are high value cars but they invite essentially investors for lack of a better word collectors sorry better word collectors to these things those auctions are actually designed to get very high prices but article 9 prefers private sales because private sales usually give better prices when was the last time that you knew somebody who bought a house at a public auction? Yeah, and but did he get a good price? Yeah. Why? Auction actually brings a lower price for real estate in the U.S. They're usually distressed houses, right? If it's and if it's a foreclosure sale, do you get to see the house? Oh, okay. Well, estate sale. All right. Um, they use auction sales, unless they're well done and have a big audience, often bring in lower prices than retail. What Article 9 wants the secured party to do is to have time to sell in an orderly fashion. So the way you normally sell, let's take real estate houses, is not by an auction, but by inviting bids, right? I'm selling my house. I'll take however long it needs, and I'm going to get the best price I possibly can, but I'm going to have time to sort through the, the offers. So Article 9 doesn't dislike private sales. In fact, it prefers them, because they tend to bring higher prices because you don't have to rush to sell it on a given day. Okay. <clears throat> it's not that auctions are inherently bad. It's just that they tend to be rushed. There's a particular kind of purchaser there. And the purchaser at an auction almost always is trying to pay less than full fair market value. Right? They're going to walk away from an auction. If the price gets close to fair market value, they're going to walk away because it's not worth it. If you're buying it to resell it and you're buying from an auction, there's no money in buying at fair market value. It has to be below fair market value for it to make sense if you're a commercial buyer. And that's usually who buys at these things. <clears throat> okay. Questions about that? So that's six ten. Now, um, let's see. That was one thirty six, right? If the car would be sold on an internet auction, would it be sufficient to give notice of the web address of the auction and the physical address of the auction company? Probably. Right. I think the case that's cited here says that it was sufficiently public for it to be a public auction. Um, is eBay an auction? Yeah. yeah, I think that would count as a public auction. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good example of an electronic version of a... Uh, After resale, Nightflyer simply sent her a statement saying the amount that was owed was $3,200. She's unsure and comes to you, her attorney slash cousin. Always a terrible place to be. Attorney slash cousin, or attorney slash friend, terrible, right? 
the worst thing that you can ever do is provide advice to your friends. And this has got nothing to do with Article 9. Giving advice to your friends is a bad, bad idea. Giving advice to your relatives, bad, bad idea. Why? Because they expect to get a really good price, usually zero, and <clears throat> they never feel like you're good enough. I have on many occasions been asked by my relatives to give them advice, and I always give them what I think is absolutely the best advice, and then they don't follow. And it's like, well, why did you ask? Well, you know. Or then they go hire somebody else, and you're like, but I told you that. And they're like, eh. Okay. You don't believe me. I know you're sitting there going, well, of course, I'm going to give good advice, and everyone believes me. Yeah, terrible idea. Don't. Here's the worst part. <coughs> you can't fire them. How do you fire your friends as your clients? Can you fire clients? Absolutely. If clients start lying to you and start not, not paying your bill, you fire them. Okay? You can't fire your relatives and you can't fire your friends. Because if you do, they're not your friends anymore. And if they're your relatives, Thanksgiving sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you took property. How many cases in that case book were relatives suing each other? Right. It's actually a family law course. <laughs> All of those cases in there are usually like the nephew suing his aunt. That was, it was, it's like all over the place. Yeah, don't, don't do work for your, your family. And I know you're going to do it, and you're not going to believe me, and 20 years from now you're going to go, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> okay. Did they do a good job with the notice? That's what this is about. So, do you have to give notice of the sale? Yes. Right? What section? 611. Great. How soon do you have to give notice? Yes. Why were you confused? <laughs> Okay, stop. If it's other than consumer goods, what is so six twelve has a, um, a safe harbor provision, right? The ten days. Yes, it has a safe harbor, right? So let me. In a transaction, other than a consumer transaction, a notice. So first, it says, except as provided, whether a notification is sent within a reasonable time is a question of fact. So you've got to give reasonable time, reasonable notice, 611. But 612, uh, 612B says there's 10 days in non-consumer transactions. So how many days do you need in a consumer transaction? Is that, Natalie, does that make you concerned that there's no statute that tells you how many days is reasonable in a consumer transaction? Let me tell you why there is no such statement. The consumer advocates who were at the negotiating table for this section back in 99, 98, were arguing for set periods of time like 20, 30 days, whatever. And the banks refused to agree to the terms that the consumer advocates were asking for. Mostly banks were at this meeting. Since they could not agree, they did not come up with a consumer with a consumer-based safe harbor. Okay? So they leave it to the courts. And that's what the comments of the section say. They leave it to the courts to decide what is fair in a consumer transaction. Not ideal. In a non-consumer transaction, 10 days. Okay. How much notice did she get? Say in the problem? <clears throat> Doesn't really, right?
right? This is post-sale. After the sale, they sent her a, a letter saying, you owe us $3,200. What section of the statute did they use to calculate the $3,200? Or should they at least have? They should have used to calculate. What section of the statute tells you how much you owe in a deficiency? I heard somebody mumble it. 615. 615. How do you know that that's the right section? Uh, it says application of proceeds and disposition of liability. It actually just says, what do you do with the money that you get from a sale, right? That's what it says. Okay, great. So, what's the first thing you pay off? 6A1. 615A1. What's the first thing you pay off? I got it on the board. Come on, what's the first thing you pay off? The expenses of the sale. So the auctioneer or whoever is helping you with the sale, whatever expenses you've incurred in order to be able to sell the asset, whatever fees are generated by the sale gets paid first. Who gets paid second? Paid second. The secured party who's foreclosing. The satisfaction of the obligations secured by the security interest or agri uh, agricultural lien under which the disposition was made. Under which the disposition was made is a reference to the fact that whoever is foreclosing, they get paid. Okay? Who gets paid next? All the other secured parties? Uh, any subordinate secured parties? Subordinate secured parties. Subordinate. So if we're talking in mortgage language, first mortgage, second mortgage, third mortgage. If the second mortgage forecloses, does the second mortgage have to pay off the third mortgage with the excess? Yes. So let's say the second mortgage is $20,000 and you sell the house for $100,000. Where does the 80000 go? Right, You paid off the expenses. You now pay off the second mortgage. Who do you pay next? The first mortgage or the third mortgage? The third mortgage, the subordinate liens, the lower liens. Does any money go to the superior lien? No. The holder of the superior lien gets nothing out of the foreclosure by a subordinate lien. So if the second, and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say mortgage even though this is not a real estate class, but I think everybody understands the language of first, second, and third mortgages. Mm -hmm. If a second mortgagee forecloses and there's excess money, they pay off the third mortgagee with it. They pay nothing to the first mortgagee. And that's consistent here, right? You pay off the subordinate liens, not the superior liens. <coughs> okay, so this is where they should have calculated the $3,200. And here's D, where they tell us what, how we calculate it, right? The security interest is made secures payment of performance of obligation. Uh, they are permitted to apply or pay, they have to, uh, under uh, D1, they pay over any excess to the debtor. Or, and remember, who's the debtor? person who has an interest in the collateral, does it include the obligor? Maybe, but only if the obligor and the debtor are the same person. The obligor gets nothing out of the sale except release from the amount of the debt that was paid off. The debtor gets the excess, the owner of the property. The person with the interest in the property gets the cash. But what if there isn't enough money? Two for a deficiency. And that's what they're doing in this problem. They're saying, you owe us $3,200. So this is the section that says how you calculate it. Is it enough to send a letter to the debtor saying, you owe us $3,200? Is that okay? Right. 
She's entitled to an explanation, right? And here, we do have a consumer section. In a consumer uh, transaction, the debtor is entitled to a surplus or where they're entitled to it. The secure party shall send an explanation to the debtor as applicable, or, or consumer on the board, after this was in, and before when the secure party accounts to the debtor and pays any surplus over, uh, or makes first written first makes written demand to the consumer obligor after the disposition. So they have to explain themselves. Did they explain themselves? No. They just said, "Yo, thirty-two hundred dollars." So what's the first thing she should do? What is six sixteen B one B say? Make a request. Send them a letter saying you owe me an explanation of how you came up to $3,200. I don't agree with your demand. They have 14 days to give it to her. Okay. <coughs> so that's the 616. If they screw up, if they've screwed up information like they haven't given her notice, might there be damages owed to her? <coughs> Take a look at 625. And, and they, they reference this in the, uh, in the problem 625 C and E. So 625 C. This section is the remedy section. <coughs> a person in that, at the time of the failure, was a debtor or held a security interest. And if the collateral was consumer goods, a person that was a debtor or a secondary obligor, at the time the secured party failed to comply with this part, may recover for that failure in any amount not less than the credit service charge. What's that? That's the interest on the loan. Plus 10% of the principal amount of the obligation or the time price difference plus 10% of the cash price, and E, in addition to those damages, may get 500 bucks. So if they screw this up, she's entitled to some damages under 625. <clears throat> okay. Take a second here and just summarize what came out of this problem, okay? So, she's entitled to reasonable notice of the sale. If she doesn't get it, that's a breach. Maybe entitled to damages under 625. There's no provision in Article 9 that states what the reasonable notice provision is for consumers. It's 10 days safe harbor for non-consumer non transactions, but in consumer transactions, we don't know. That's because the courts are allowed to give more, typically, okay? She also has a right, oh, and before we get there, if you look at section 614, section 614 sets out the notice that she is entitled to get. It, there is a safe harbor with respect to the, what the contents of the notice, and that's 614 in consumer transactions. It's 613 in non-consumer transactions. So if you're a secure party and you send a letter that sets out the information contained in section 614, then you've sent adequate notice by definition, okay? 616, she's entitled to an explanation of how much she owes as a deficiency. And she's entitled to an explanation of how they calculated it. The section that tells us how you calculate it is 615. 616 tells us that you're entitled to an explanation of that. All right. Is that good? <coughs> ben. Oops, sorry. Sometimes my head's get a little confused here. <coughs>
What about the fact that the price is low? She says 34 <laughs> is not enough. Is a low price by itself proof that the sale was not commercially reasonable? Just remember, I think it's 610, right? 610 says that all aspects of the sale have to be reasonable. 610. Every aspect of a disposition of a collateral, including the method, manner, time, place, and other terms, must be commercially reasonable. If it's not commercially reasonable, you go to 625 and you might get damages, right? In fact, we'll look at 620, uh, 626 in a minute. 627 says, however, <clears throat> the fact that a greater amount could have been obtained by a collection, enforcement, disposition, or acceptance, is not itself sufficient to preclude the secured party from establishing that the collection is commercially reasonable. So two questions. Who has the burden of proof to prove that it was commercially reasonable? Nobody? Who's required to establish that the sale was commercially reasonable? The secured party, yes. Now, second, is a low price by itself enough to establish that the sale was unreasonable? No. Okay, so she's, she's looking at $3,200. What did she sell? Or what did the, sorry, what did the secured party sell? Where would you look to see what the value of the car was? The Kelly Blue Book, right? You'd go online. You'd see what the price of the value of the car was at the time of the sale, according to the Blue Book. If it's $4,000, is it going to be commercially unreasonable? If it's $12,000, would that suggest that there's a problem with the sale? Yes. So you have two pieces of information. The price that it was sold at and what it was, being, what it was selling for elsewhere. Who bought the collateral in the problem? <coughs> the secured party did. Yeah. Is a secured, the secured party bought the collateral. How can that possibly be okay? Is that okay? Why is it okay? Because it says so. Hopefully you're, at this point, in the 14th week of the semester, most of the answers to this, to these questions are in the code. Okay? Not always. Like, how much is reasonable notice for a consumer? Not in the code. Not there. What is the definition of breach of the peace? Not in the code. What is commercially <coughs> reasonable? They tell us that it has to be commercially reasonable. They don't establish what is. But they give us some situations where they have defaults. So, like, if you include the notice in 613 or 614, you say what the statute says the letter should say, it's commercially reasonable. Okay? If you give a non-consumer debtor 10 days notice of the intent to sell, it's commercially reasonable. There are some safe harbors, but they don't define all of these things. Can a secured party buy at the foreclosure sale? Yes. But there's two conditions. One, it's either a public disposition. So what's public? Auction. And there we feel like, okay, there's no disadvantage. They're as good a bidder as anybody else. Can they buy at a private sale? Only if what? I just remember the case or something that we read. It was like if the person bought it and like nobody else showed up to bid it. Like you have to actually have other people bidding. Right. So the public sale has to be reasonable, right? The public disposition has to be commercially reasonable. Can you buy at a private mm -hmm. sale? Yes, if the collateral is of the type where there's a... Yeah, you're reading off the statute. Give me an example. No, you're exactly right. If you're able to... If, if you're able to 
What would be an example of a collateral that would fit 610C2? A, a car. I mean, like, so, if you so, but that would be usually, if, so how would a car fit in that? If, if there's other cars available on the market, then you can determine what the price of that car should be. Are they regularly sold on a recognized market? Where do you usually buy cars? Well, in today's world, all over the place. There's people that are- I understand, but machines, people do people typically go to a public marketplace and bid against other sellers at the time to buy it? In car auctions? Yeah. It, but the consumers are not allowed to car auctions. You have to be an accredited buyer usually to go to a car auction. I don't think cars actually fit. Okay, you're thinking of houses, mortgage? I'm thinking of stock. The New York Stock Exchange. The point of 610C2 is that there's no argument about what the price is. If you sell 100 shares of AT&T stock, how do you know what the price was on any given day? Where would you find that price? Yeah, you'd go to the New York Times, you'd go to the Wall Street Journal, you'd go to some nationally recognized publication that publishes prices for stock. So they buy it a, they buy it a private sale, but it's on a recognized market. And although cars have auctions, they're not the way people typically buy cars. Usually it's one-on-one, -on -one, not in a public auction. And what they're talking about here is in the, mark, the, the New York Stock Exchange is such a big marketplace that it's rare that any one investor can move the market in any significant amount. So if, you have, if you're a secured party and you have 100 shares of AT&T and you sell it, the, the market dictates the price. Right? There's no private negotiation between two parties. You just go to the marketplace and say, I got 100 shares and it sells. You can do that if you're the secured party, you can buy and just pay that price, right? Go to the New York Times, go to the Wall Street Journal, go to, well, I don't know, who, who does indexes for a stock now online? Who would we trust? Dow Jones, I think, probably has an index. Yeah. That's, that's the Wall Street Journal, essentially. You'd be fine. You just pay that price. What was the closing price on a given day? You pay that price. Okay. So, um, <coughs> The suspiciously low price here would be evidenced by probably the Kelly Blue. So if the cars were worth 12 and the secured party bought for 3,200, yeah, that doesn't look good. Yep. Um, now, even if they violate this, but they got the full value of the car, it may not be unreasonable. They may, they may have gotten a good price. They may have paid a, a good price. Um, okay. One thirty seven. Oh man, I went too slow. We got three minutes. Let me uh, let me tell you what I think is important from problem one thirty seven. <clears throat> um, everybody who's involved is entitled to the notice. So problem A, one thirty seven A is everybody under six eleven C two is Otis, oral notice is not enough. It says send notice. That's what the statute says. Right here, send. Um, there is an exception. Stock was sold on a recognized market. No notice is required. That's an exception. That's the statute says that. The equipment, however, does require notice. 617 says if you buy from somebody who is selling foreclosed property, you take it free of anybody else's interest, except for senior, right? So anybody who is being foreclosed on, so the secured party and any subordinate secured parties, you take free of that. <clears throat> now here, it didn't look like Crowley was a good faith purchaser, so maybe, eh, um, that didn't work. Um, under uh, question C, does the wife deserve notice. Does the wife deserve notice? She's a debtor and an obligor. Does she deserve notice of the sale? Separate notice. Yes. So that would violate her rights. Everybody who has is entitled to notice should get notice. It's probably okay to send notice to the two people through the same notice if they live at the same address, but it's risky. It's better to send individual notice to everybody. 
That way you don't run afoul of it. Um, question D, what about the fact that the, uh, the, there was a return of notice? That the person is clear that they didn't get the mail. The answer there is <clears throat> probably isn't commercially reasonable. All right, I'll finish this up next time. All right, so I'll see you on Friday. I just realized now I did not hand in the sign in sheet today. Oh well, it looks like everybody's here. So um, on Friday, oh, as you're leaving, I will give more information about the exam at class on Friday. I will record class on Friday in case there are people who can't make it. So I will have that. Again, my my intent is for it to be an essay only exam, whether that's shorter essays or longer essays, I'm still working out, but that's, uh, there's not going to be multiple choice. It's going to be <coughs> written out essays. Um, I will have, at the Friday class, I will announce a review session next week. Classes end on Tuesday, right? So Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, one of those days, I'll find a time where I have a space of time and I'll do a review as well. But on Friday, I'll finish up these problems and we'll look at the exam that I put on the website so we can, you can take a look at those questions and we'll go through them together, okay? So we'll do that on Friday. So my plan on Friday is from 12 to 12.30, finish up the problems and just emphasize the stuff I want you to know. And then from 12.30 until 12, uh, sorry, 11.30 to 12.05, we'll review that exam that I posted. So if you take a few minutes before class on Friday and review it, I will go over it, and I will also post a sample answer for you, so you will have that too. Yeah, regular time, regular time, nothing unusual, just 10.50 uh, to 12.05, and I will schedule a review session for next week. And you can send me emails, and you can post questions on the, on the Blackboard site. It is on Tuesday, December 3rd at 9 a.m. That's my recollection. So, I have a Yes.